Good afternoon. Um, welcome. My name is uh, Lex von Geen. I'm a geochemist and a research professor at Le Mans Doherty Earth Observatory. And, um, and uh, Peter Schlosser, who is the uh, associate director of the Earth Institute, uh, asked me to help me him organize uh, these um, sessions, uh, seminars in our sustainable development series. The, um, the theme today is water management in agriculture. Yeah, you all have seen the, the program. And I think we have a nice uh, combination of presentations by experts in the field. Uh, the idea is that we are going to have five 15-minute sections, more or less. And um, if possible, it would be better if you limited your questions to sort of points of clarification, points of information. And then we'll have a discussion, a panel discussion, at the end of the five presentation uh, on, on you know, whatever you, you may wish, wish to, to ask. Um, so the uh, sequence of speakers is as follows. Uh, first of all, um, Ukman Ulal is going to um, present his perspective on irrigation efficiency in India, China, and the US. Uh, um, uh, Professor Lal is in the um, Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering at, uh, at Columbia University. Uh, his presentation will be followed by a presentation by Holly Michael, who uh, traveled uh, from the University of Delaware, and um, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences there, and she's going to uh, tell us, present us a, uh, a, a really a, a unique model, a hydrological model and geochemical model for the Bengal Basin, and she will use this uh, model to tell us something about the potential impact of uh, irrigation pumping on the distribution of arsenic in groundwater aquifers in that part of the world, a problem some of you may have heard about. After uh, Holly's talk, uh, uh, we're for fortunate to have with us John Duxbury, uh, who traveled down from Cornell and is on his way to Bangladesh tonight, in fact. Uh, John is a professor in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, and uh, he's going to uh, uh, tell us something about uh, uh, water management, uh, novel ways to manage water use in rice paddies in, in Bangladesh to reduce arsenic toxicity to rice. Uh, after that, we have uh, our own uh, uh, Vijay Modi, who is a, a professor uh, in um, mechanical uh, engineering at Columbia, and he's going to tell us about uh, an interesting project he's carrying out in, uh, in Gujarat that involves water metering. Uh, clearly another issue uh, relevant to water management. And then at the end of these presentation, Manu Lal is actually going to come back and tell us about something which is somewhat related. It's the use of tensiometers in some rice paddies in Punjab and how they can be used to uh, use the uh, water in a more efficient way. So I'll uh, invite uh, Manu to start first. Okay, thanks, Lex. Uh, so when Lex asked me to do this talk, uh, he wanted me to give sort of an overview to get things started, and that's the flavor uh, of what I'll talk about. And uh, the basic idea I'll try to convey is that we'll be looking at issues related to irrigation for agriculture. Basically, the idea is that we, we want to promote food security, and water plays a major role in that. But in the process of playing that role, we are ending up with negative effects on the environment in various places, uh, partly because of groundwater depletion and partly because of pollution of both ground and surface water sources. So that's sort of the story that I'm going to try to develop and hopefully that will set up the talks that come after that. So starting out, uh, this is a slide which I have pirated from uh, Professor Kasman at the University of Nebraska who presented an overview of this sort um, for the National Academy a few years back. Uh, essentially, what you are seeing is rice, wheat, and maize on the top frame, and how the yields of each of these has increased over time in different countries. And the point he wants to make with this is that there's, these increases have been due to various technological innovations, some of which include irrigation, which is the subject for today, but by and large, these are plateauing out. And what that is doing is exhibited in the lower frame here, 
And the idea that's being shown there is that as people see that the yields in each country plateau out at relatively different levels, they start increasing the cropping intensity, which is the frequency with which you plant, uh, and they also start increasing the land area that is irrigated. So the irrigation is showing up in that sense as a major thing. The bottom right shows a different view of that in a way, and uh, I don't see Professor Pedro Sanchez here because I was hoping to hit him with this. Uh, and the reason is that he often argues that even in the United States, most of the land is rain-fed and not irrigated. And the yields for rain-fed agriculture are comparable to that of irrigated agriculture. But if you look at those two graphs that Kasman presents from Nebraska, what you see for maize and soybean is on the x-axis is the yield realized and on the y-axis is the coefficient of variation or the variability associated with that yield. And the blue dots are all irrigated agriculture and the orange-green dots are all rain-fed agriculture. And the point is made very clearly that if you are in the very top end performance of rain-fed agriculture, yes, you get close to irrigated yields, but otherwise you're far, far away from it. So this establishes the motivation pretty clearly, I think, as to why people are going for more and more irrigation in places as they have increasing food requirements. Um, so this set of graphics is now taken from a paper by Peter Dahl and Siegfried Siebert from 1995. Uh, there are newer versions of some of these things, but not all in one place, so I'm sticking with this one. So what you see on the top graphic is the distribution of irrigated areas around the world. And what you see that is remarkable about this sort of a graphic is that these are not uniformly distributed around the world. They are concentrated in a few places, which then suggests that if you start exceeding the average annual rainfall or average annual recharge into groundwater in the case that people are using groundwater for irrigation, those places will start preferentially having problems associated with this. Um, and what you see is that largely it, these areas are concentrated in China, in India, uh, a little bit in southeastern Australia, and then in the Midwestern and Western United States. Okay, so those are the hotspots in terms of thinking about irrigated agriculture and its issues. The table on the right bottom gives you two pieces of information, one which we won't worry about right now, which is the cropping intensity, and the second is the irrigation efficiency. The reason I bring that up right away in the talk is that if we want irrigation to support us to get higher yields, which is sort of the idea in a more reliable way, but we don't do it very efficiently, then there is an opportunity to increase that efficiency and get a little bit more mileage out of it instead of planting larger and larger areas, which from an environmental perspective we are not happy about. So I've highlighted Canada and the United States and then East Asia and Southeast Asia there, and uh, right above that is South Asia actually. So the difference that is shown there is that the irrigation efficiencies reported by these people range from 0.3 to 0.7 or so. Okay. The question is, what does an irrigation efficiency actually mean? Because if you read some other literature, you might see numbers closer to 0.1 to 0.15 or 0.2. So what's the difference between those two? And the difference primarily is that the people who report the much smaller numbers are talking about the ratio of the water actually transpired by the plant to the total water applied at a particular field. And this group here is reporting numbers at a river basin scale. And their idea is that if somebody is over applying water in a particular field, maybe that goes into the ground, it emerges somewhere else, and so it's available to you, so you haven't lost it. And we'll discuss that a little bit as we go along. Um, another frame on looking at irrigation is that f using the crops that are actually grown and the efficiencies with which at the basin scale they are, what they are being watered, Peter Dahl and Seabird produce the map above which shows the net irrigation requirements as a function of location around the world. So this is the amount of water you would on average apply each year uh, using 1960 to 1990 climate data uh, if you wanted to grow those crops in those places. So what you see as hotspots that emerge are essentially the same places because if you have much higher amount of irrigation and you're growing crops there uh, which require a lot of water beyond what's available, the same areas basically pop up. And what you see 
is that the endogenetic planes actually dominate that story. Okay? And one reason for that, uh, many of you, I'm assuming, have some familiarity with what's going on with groundwater in the world, and if not, I'll just hint at it very quickly, is many people now talk about the Yellow River or the Huanghe in China, where groundwater has been depleted significantly, and the Yellow River, in fact, vanished for a good, goodly period, and they are in the process of restoring it. But if you compare the, the bottom two figures, you see that if you look at the potential evaporation for the crops in the Huanghe versus the precipitation in the Huanghe, the, they are almost peaking at the same time. So the differences are associated with the intensity of total cultivation rather than just asymmetry in the timing. Whereas if you go to the ganges, you see that you have a, in, in, a, a much higher deficit because of the changes in the timing as well. So that's why the hotspot basically shows up there in part. If we come to the United States, because most of us live here, so you want to know something about it, the graphics here are from the US Geological Survey from uh, their assessment in 2006. And they show you the state by state by state uh, where irrigation is prominent and the sources of irrigation surface and groundwater. And if you jump to the picture on the right, what you see are total water withdrawals and in green, the total irrigation estimated by these people. And what's interesting here is that the total irrigation as well as total water use in the United States has flattened out. Okay. Now, the thesis that I'm going to present to you is that this is not the case over most of the world, but in the United States, there are a couple of things that have happened that have caused this to go on, even though actually the total production of crops and total irrigated area has increased. So let's look at that. Here uh, in the United States, people are concerned about the Ogallala Aquifer and also the South Florida Aquifer. The Ogallala is what you see in the Midwest. The, Ogala, the South Florida one is obvious. And the graphic there highlights the percentage of total irrigation that comes from groundwater there. The one surprise in that figure is the lower Mississippi River Valley, because you would think that there's enough water there that groundwater usage would not be dominant. But it turns out that there's not that much diversion of that water in that area. So it's predominantly groundwater irrigated again. So that's kind of interesting. And then if you move to the top right, uh, there you see the irrigated area going up, but the total irrigated water application actually decreasing in the recent period. So what's the story associated with that? There are two things. On the bottom right, what you see is three snapshots in time which give you some indication of the different methods of irrigation application. So the thing that is at the bottom there, which is called gravity, is essentially flood irrigation. The, the ones above that are two different types of sprinklers, and then after that are uh, the smaller quantities that are being supplied by things that are considered to be much more efficient, such as drip irrigation. So what you see happening in this trajectory is that the, to the percentage of irrigated area associated with flooding the fields has gone down, and sprinklers have gone up, and drip has gone up a little bit. Okay? But that's basically the that's one contributor to the story. You have to keep in mind that drip is primarily associated with uh, orchards and with vegetable gardening and not with grain. So the grain issue is different. So the second factor that has kicked in here is this, which is the shift in crops. And uh, it's sort of subtle here, the way these people show it, because many of the crops don't really change. What is shown here is a reduction in other lands and farms. And so it's hard to know what that means uh, when somebody puts it that way. But that means basically pasture land that was irrigated. Uh, it means corn that was being grown not as a grain, but for sugar production or uh, so on. So those things have reduced and corn for grain has gone up some, and other grains have reduced. The other grain that has dramatically reduced is rice, primarily. So, so the shift in crops plus the methods of irrigation account for this. So one way of thinking about it is a message for the other places in the world, maybe, can you do these two things in some way uh, and get somewhere? And I think Vijay and I, when we are talking later, one of the things we'll point out, hopefully, is that some of the things such as sprinklers and mechanization is much harder to do in developing countries where the farm sizes are way smaller, unless there's coordination between people. So some of that opportunity is not there, so we have to look, look at other ways to achieve the same sort of ends. 
The second issue associated with irrigation that I want to highlight is that of pollution. And it's an interesting one because if you look on the left side here, the graphics show pesticide leaching uh, from farms and uh, nitrogen leaching from farms as a surrogate for other f for total fertilizer. And it turns out that this accounts for about half the total pollution in the main river body rivers in the United States. And if you look on the bottom right, you see with fertilizer that this, this has been a fairly steady increase but leveling off in the recent period. But the residence time associated with many of these pro products is quite a bit longer and so these things stay. Um, if I had the same picture associated for China, which shows up on the next graphic, what you see there is that's a steady climb that's still going on in terms of fertilizer application. And in China, it's roughly 50% of the fertilizer that is unaccounted for. Okay, so if you look at it that way, you start wondering why you would spend money on something that you're essentially throwing away, which shows up as, as pollution. And the net result of that in the graphic from China is on the top. Red means a river body is grade five, which is as polluted as you can get. Yellow is slightly better and blue is probably okay. So in most of the agricultural areas in China, things are not good. Um, the graphic on the right shows you one person's estimates of how much groundwater is being used by country and how that has changed over time. So the red curve, which is the second highest one, is the United States. It's flat, consistent with what we saw earlier. The champion curve is India. It really takes off. And then China is the blue curve, which is number three at the very end uh, as you go through. So the, high, the reason I'm highlighting this is that much of the mindset in the United States in terms of the agricultural people who are associated with irrigation was designing canal irrigation systems. And they propagated that in other places in the world. And today, the groundwater fraction of irrigation dominates. And so several of the things that were thought as golden truths, for example, at the basin scale, you have high efficiency because return flows will propagate or something one should question as one goes through. So the summary observation I have at this point is that it's good that we have irrigation because it helps us improve yields, but the combination of excess fertilizer application and excess irrigation leads to excess leaching, which is a problem. And also it leads to groundwater depletion, which is a problem. So we have to think about how we deal with solving those problems. And the side issue there is how do you actually define efficiency? And I think intellectually that's become an issue because uh, of the arguments that I'll show you coming right up. So these are due to a colleague I had when I was at Utah State University called Rick Allen and Lyman Willardson and others. These people are big names in the FAO sort of world and they are actually very competent people who have done these things and they lay out how one should think about different aspects of water application in agriculture and what can be considered beneficial use and what cannot and you add all that up and see what you do with it in terms of defining an efficiency but basically the efficiency is going to be total water used beneficially in some way including by evapotranspiration transpiration by the plant divided by the total water that you applied or diverted from a water body into it. So that's fairly simple and straightforward. And the typical canal irrigation bent comes through here because they argue, particularly in topography such as is present in Utah and Colorado, uh, if the person who is high up in the topography wat waters their field to excess, that water will go into the ground back into the canal and used by the next person. In fact, it's typical for somebody in Colorado to say that they use the water in the canal six times, okay, because of return flows. So that I think is good. So the argument that Rick Allen makes is that you should think about scale effects rather than getting hung up on on-farm water application efficiency because there might be reasons to do that. But some of the things these people say, for example, look at the wording they have, benefit of low efficiency. Now, when, what they mean by low efficiency is not the system level efficiency, but the on-farm application efficiency, although they don't make that clear. And they say the benefits are this provides recharge to unconfined aquifers. It contributes to damping flood flows, which is sort of odd because if you maintain high soil moisture, you're not going to reduce flood flows, you're going to enhance them. But what they actually mean when you talk to them is that 
oh, well, we can divert during a flood water into the fields, and you should count that. But that's not intentional irrigation, so I don't think that's fair. Um, and then they talk about augmentation of stream flow during droughts because you have excess irrigation, and incidental groundwater recharge near oceans uh, may help reduce salt water intrusion and creation of fake wetlands. Uh, I don't quite see this set as particularly pleasing in terms of an engineering viewpoint of efficiency. So I put it up there, not with the intention of criticizing them, but because since these people are with the, involved heavily with the FAO, this kind of mantra goes out to many people who may or may not think about what they transpire through. So then he's also got a list of appropriate reasons to consider on-farm efficiency, which are all good. Uh, and some reasons which he says are inappropriate, and I think those are pretty iffy. So the main thing that I want to draw, drive out with this set is that I, I, feel, I feel that it's important that one looks at both on-farm efficiency and system level efficiency and find ways to improve them. And particularly with groundwater, the idea that you pump from depth, apply excess water, allow it to recharge at a relatively slow rate and pump it back up, is at the very least very inefficient in terms of energy usage and uh, not particularly a good idea. So the second thing that uh, I want to bring up here as an example is, is something our group has done and that is conscious spatial optimization of crops. And the argument here is that, okay, maybe you want to look at a system level, but let's take the system to an even larger scale beyond river basins and look at where you should grow specific crops which are best suited for a particular climate, not just the mean annual rainfall in a place, but also the variation so that you can reduce irrigation requirements. So this is done by our group, and the goal was maximize total farm income for India on the crops that the government procures, because the price is set on those, so you don't have to worry about price fluctuations. And um, can you do it with rain-fed agriculture alone? Can you do it with a minimum amount of irrigation alone? And how and meet all the production targets that they have. Is that possible? So when you run that model, and this particular run that I'm showing you is what happens with rain-fed, on the left is where rice is being grown today, on the right is where it, the model wants to grow rice. So you see a substantial shift there, and uh, it actually doesn't just say shift rice from A to B, it tells you how much area it goes under rice there. Similarly, with pulses, you see fairly dramatic shifts, uh, and the net result of all this is that if you look at the picture on the left, that's the water deficit uh, divided by mean annual rainfall, uh, district by district in India under the current pattern, and anything that is uh, pink or red is greater than one. So you're basically using more water, substantially more water than the average annual rainfall, which is your upper limit on renewable supply. And on the right is the solution that comes up as far as water deficit is concerned after that. Okay, so you get a fairly substantial improvement there. And what's interesting is that you get a substantial increase in total agricultural revenue as well. Now the yields are lower under rain-fed conditions. Okay, so this is on average, and this doesn't, this doesn't address the fact that there are years that are major drought years and will be much worse than average. So, but on average, even rain-fed conditions deliver you higher income than what is realized with all the irrigation that goes on today with free energy being supplied, which is something which is going to take. Um, the irrigation water requirement in the rain-fed case obviously is not there, but if you allow a certain amount of irrigation uh, nationally, it turns out that uh, you, can all, you can dramatically increase your revenue, and the revenue increase is coming partly from, or I would say dramatically from the increase in oil seeds which is a high value item and you're starting to grow it in many places which are not water stressed. And rice shifts to places which are, which don't need to be water stressed with respect to rice. So that's the kind of solution that comes out. So uh, to sum up, I think we are at a point in the world where we, to meet the growing populations, we absolutely need irrigation to help us. Uh, but, and we need fertilizers to help us. But we need to do this intelligently. Doing it intelligently means increasing on-farm water application efficiency. It means looking at system level efficiency, and it means looking at a national or global scale and figuring out where it is best to grow different things. And the subtext of that is that if you actually pay attention to these things, you increase people's income.
So let's talk about it. Okay. Um, thanks for having me here. So I'm going to talk um, about the hydrological effects of irrigation, particularly in the Bengal Basin, and thinking about um, sustainability of the use of groundwater for irrigation, mostly with respect to water quality, but at the end, I, I, if I have time, I might talk a little bit about um, some issues of water quantity as well. Um, there are lots of different aspects of this work that have uh, collaborators. So um, some of these are here. Um, Carrie Radloff just finished her PhD um, here at Columbia, and I'm working with Lex Van Geen and Martin Stute, Yan Zeng, um, Mahfuz Khan, and Kazi Martina Ahmed and Pradeep Sikdar. So um, just a, a global thought about irrigation. Uh, we just saw a great talk on this already, but irrigation accounts for about 70% of our world water use, about 90% of the consumptive use. Um, and groundwater irrigation accounts for about 43% of the total amount of irrigation, and this is increasing globally. So this is a chart of water usage, again, 70% agriculture, about 20% industry and energy, much of which uh, is, is then returned to the system, and then 10% uh, domestic use. And this, all of this groundwater use can lead to quantity issues, so groundwater depletion, issues of salinization, um, changes in soil chemistry and buildup of chemicals in the soil. We'll hear, hear more about this with respect to arsenic in plants later. Um, and then changes in hydrology and hydrogeology, um, which can lead to quality issues, and that's what I'll talk about now. So this, I think, is a similar map to what you just showed, a global map of irrigated areas. And you can see very intense irrigation um, in this er area in southern Asia. And so I'm specifically going to talk about the Bengal Basin there. Uh, Google Earth image of this area. This is India around here and Bangladesh. Here are the Himalayan mountains. This is the Bay of Bengal. And the problem here, um, I can't go into too much detail about it, but there are high levels of arsenic contamination, naturally occurring arsenic in groundwater in, in southern Asia, in many parts of southern Asia. And uh, it is a big problem in the Bengal Basin. The colors here on this map, this is a map of Bangladesh. The colors are arsenic concentrations in wells measured throughout the region. The Bangladesh and India arsenic standard is 50 micrograms per liter. It's kind of a peach color. Uh, the World Health Organization arsenic health standard is, is 10 micrograms per liter. It's a light blue. So only these bl dark blue dots are safe according to the world standard for arsenic. So that means that within approximately this area, and this extends over into West Bengal and India, there is a high risk for high levels of arsenic. Um, if we plot that same data with depth, this is arsenic concentration with well depth. Um, this green line is the 50 microgram per liter regional standard. You can see that arsenic levels are, are highly variable and there are some very high levels, but mostly the high levels are contained to the shallow groundwater. So below about 150 meter depth, there is uh, widely low arsenic throughout the region. So one question is, is this distribution of arsenic sustainable if we start to use deep groundwater um, for drinking and for irrigation? So a cartoon conceptual model of how the system works looks something like this. There uh, is a lot of irrigation, um, pumping groundwater, and then there are also smaller pumps, usually hand pumps for domestic use. The irrigation use in the region is about 10 times the domestic groundwater use. And so this creates some sort of vigorous flow paths in the shallow part of the system. Unfortunately, this is also where the arsenic is in the top 100 meters or so. There's a lot of water in the system. It's monsoonal, so every year much of the area floods. There are lots of rivers and, and uh, ponds on the surface, so there, there is a lot of available water. Deeper in the system, um, the sediments are a little bit different. They're older, um, and so often they can immobilize arsenic. They, they absorb arsenic. Um, and there are also changes in lithology. So often if you dig a well, you'll see sand and clay alternating 
um, which, which uh, then affects how the groundwater flows. So the question is, if wells are put deeper into this system, will they just pull the high arsenic groundwater down from the shallow region, or will they somehow remain arsenic safe, so sustainable? And one way they could do that is hydraulically. So if the water flowing to these deep wells comes from somewhere outside of the area where there's high arsenic in shallow depths. And the second way is chemically. So even if the water is coming from the surface, maybe the sediments can immobilize the arsenic before it gets to the wells. To understand how this flow system works, we have to back up and think of the system on a larger scale. Think of it on the whole. And so um, on a larger scale, these low permeability clay units, it's harder for, for the water to flow through these units, these aren't continuous over the basin. But still, the groundwater may be flowing uh, laterally in the deep parts of the system and coming from somewhere far away. So to understand how the groundwater flows, uh, we can consider the entire basin. Um, so this contour encompasses all of the permeable sediments of the Bengal Basin, and we made a model that um, encompasses all of those sediments with mod flow. So this is a groundwater flow model. It's large scale, about 600 by 600 kilometers, going to about three kilometers deep. Um, and so this is uh, the, the 3D grid, and in each one of these little cells we can calculate um, hydraulic heads in the system and how the groundwater is flowing, and later I'll show you a solute transport model where we can calculate concentrations. Okay, so looking at some model simulation results, these are groundwater flow paths to deep parts of the Bengal Basin groundwater system before there's any pumping. On the left, I have um, just dots, so these are actually um, water particle endpoints. They're just evenly distributed at a depth of 200 meters in the system, and then we can track backwards how um, the, the water that reaches these points we can track back where it came from. So these paths are from the recharge points to each of these locations at depth. And so what you see is that these flow paths are often very long. Um, some are 100 kilometers or more in the system, um, in the deep part of the system before there's any pumping. But if we include pumping, so the same system parameters, meaning the same geology in the system, we can assume, and we add pumping here on the left, both irrigation and domestic pumping, and we see that the system, the flow system looks completely different. You might not even see anything here, and there actually are flow paths, but they're very vertical, they're flowing just from the surface down to depth. So, um, and another effect of this pumping, aside from just the flow paths, is that it increases the recharge to the system. So where there's enough water, it actually creates a lot more uh, flow through the system, more than three times. So water use has pretty important impacts on hydrogeologic systems. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask this question about whether groundwater flow paths can protect deep groundwater. Can, can they create sustainability of this deep low arsenic resource? And so we can consider different pumping alternatives. The first you might think is the most conservative. Let's say we don't want to use, we don't want to have any arsenic in our water, either for irrigation or for domestic use. We could put all of the pumps deep in the system. Another option is to leave the, the irrigation wells where they are currently, which is generally shallow, and then put domestic wells used for drinking water deeper in the system. And we can simulate this inside of this area where there's high arsenic. Okay, so this is two uh, views of the system, one from above and one sort of from the side. These are flow paths within that high arsenic area if all, of the if all of the wells are put deep into the system at depths of greater than 200 meters. And what you can see is that the flow paths are, are pretty vertical. So water is flowing from the surface uh, down to the, the deep wells. That means that if you're inside this high arsenic area, then the arsenic will eventually migrate down to the wells. Um, you see a very different picture with the split scheme. So if only the domestic wells are put deep into the system, some of the flow paths are very long. So uh, this water reaching the wells in this area is coming 
uh, very deep in the system all the way from the, the edges of the system. So in some areas, there may be uh, sustainable low arsenic groundwater. It's originating outside of this high arsenic area. And if we compare those two management schemes, we can see that the split pumping scheme, uh, about 90% of the area is either sustainable, meaning the water is coming from outside of that area, or the travel times, the flow paths are very long, longer than 1,000 years. And we can compare that to only 14% in the deep pumping scheme. So clearly, the irrigation in the system is really important to the sustainability with respect to arsenic in this case. Um, and one reason that that is is that irrigation wells can act as a hydraulic barrier. This is a plot of hydraulic head versus depth. We have the irrigation well zone above the domestic well zone in this split scheme. And I've plotted hydraulic head profiles at three locations, vertical profiles in the basin. The blue and green are in areas where water is, is sustainable. It's coming from outside the high arsenic area. And the red is an area where it's not sustainable. And so what you see is that in the areas that are sustainable, the hydraulic head in the irrigation well zone is lower than it is in the domestic well zone, which effectively creates an upward flow of water. So water is not going to flow, high arsenic water will not flow down to these deep domestic wells. The opposite is true in areas that um, that are not sustainable. So you might ask, well, we really don't want to irrigate, irrigate necessarily with high arsenic water, and we'll hear about some reasons that that's true. So um, maybe there should be some alternatives. What if we switch to, to surface water irrigation, for example? And um, so we simulated cases where uh, there's half the amount of irrigation pumping, um, the red is no irrigation pumping, and this black profile is pre-development. And so what you can see is that we still get this profile. This is the green is the original amount of irrigation pumping. The blue has approximately the same profile with half irrigation pumping. And with no irrigation pumping at all, we get very close to the pre-development case, which if you remember has fairly long flow paths. So really even without this irrigation hydraulic barrier, um, the, the model simulation tells us that still about 90% of that area would um, be sustainable on a thousand year time scale. Um, okay, so the second part is whether chemical properties of Bengal Basin sediments can improve sustainability. So um, this, I'm going to quickly talk about work of Carrie Radloff. Um, she did some experiments with the deep sediments to see how much arsenic they could they could immobilize. And so she did some lab experiments where she took sediments and, and put them in the lab. And then she also did field experiments where she injected high arsenic groundwater into the aquifer system and then pulled it back out and measured how much arsenic there was. And so what she found is that um, if, if the aquifer sediments did not absorb or mobilize the arsenic, um, she would expect to see concentrations that go like this over time during her experiment. But what she, what she saw were these concentrations. So the difference between these is the effect of adsorption. And so from these experiments, she could estimate adsorption parameters, which we then put into our flow and solute transport model. So this is a model result um, calculating now concentration. So again, you see these full paths that I had before. And the colors now are arsenic concentrations normalized um, at a depth of um, the top of the, of the deep pumping horizon after a thousand years, and I've cut, off, I've cut it off at uh, 0.1. So what you see are arsenic contaminated areas greater than 10% of the maximum. And if there's no absorption in the system, about 56% of the area becomes contaminated. If there is absorption, a uh, KD of 1 or a retardation factor of 14, which is probably a conservative estimate for carry sediments, only 1% of the area is contaminated. And this is with that split scheme. If all of, if the irrigation wells are, are put deeper into the system, um, this is what we get. So if there is no sorption, 92% of the area is contaminated. And with sorption, it's still not a great outlook. 63% of the area is still contaminated. So uh, some thoughts on irrigation and sustainability in the Bengal Basin. First, pumping, and especially irrigation, because it's the most, it's the greatest groundwater use, really affects flow. Uh, 
secondly, groundwater irrigation is an important factor in the sustainability for both arsenic migration and for groundwater depletion, which I, I didn't talk about. And lastly, management should target irrigation. So maybe there should be restrictions on depth and, and quantity of water pump for irrigation or potentially alternatives. Um, and so if I have a couple of minutes, I thought I would talk a little bit about a potential scheme to um, uh, a management scheme that might um, reduce depletion. So might deal with a water quantity issue rather than a water quality issue. And um, so this is, is an idea that was brought up um, about 35 years ago, actually, by Roger Ravel in a science paper in 1975. Um, and, and the World Bank is interested in this, and they asked us to think a little bit about it. And so we have been. And so the question is, can large-scale irrigation pumping be managed for hydrologic benefits? So this scheme is kind of involved, and uh, it looks something like this. So um, if we have... Ah, I missed that. Here we're thinking actually mostly about the upper Ganges Basin where depletion is more of an issue uh, before we were looking at the lower Ganges Basin. And, and one, one big problem in this system is that um, the downstream areas uh, see effects of upstream diversions for irrigation. And, and one of those effects is that during the dry season, the flows are lower, and so there are salinization issues and water um, water quantity issues, and during the monsoon season, all the dams are open, and um, there is a lot of water that creates flooding. Right. So, this idea is that so there are a lot of canals in the upper part of the Ganges Basin. They're already existing. The idea is that um, canals can, in the dry season can divert the river flow to go to irrigation fields and also to go to other downstream reaches of the river and this can be blocked off by a dam. Um, and then pumps can be installed near the river, alongside the river, and that water can then be carried to fields for irrigation, and it can also be diverted downstream. So the water that's pumped during the dry season is used to augment the dry season flow, so increase the, the flow in the river in the dry season. And if we look at this in cross-section, um, we have pumping and recharge during the monsoon, so if we pump during the dry season, the hydraulic head might look something like this, so it's very low near the river, and then it recharges during the monsoon. And so th it, this area in here is water that's stored during the monsoon, so that can actually act to reduce uh, the monsoon flooding. And so we've thought about this a little bit and done some very simple simulations, thinking about um, different conditions in the volume stored. And so these are the simulated hydraulic head profiles for uh, two different pumping rates, but we can consider lots of factors. And, and this is the volume stored per year per 3,200 kilometer uh, reach of river. And so that science paper estimated about uh, 70 uh, billion meters cubed per year. And in these two simulations, we get a little bit less than that. Um, but it's, it's pretty widely varying. So um, I don't know if this is the answer. I mean, maybe it's a pretty involved scheme, but um, I think it might be worth thinking about whether there are creative or alternative ways to manage ir irrigation for sustainability. Um, so thanks again to collaborators and funders. That's it. Uh, thank you. I'm going to talk uh, specifically about water uh, and rice, and you see some of our collaborators and our donors uh, for this work. Uh, rice, of course, uses a lot of water compared to other crops, but actually not more in terms of transpiration. In other words, the actual plant requirement of rice is no different than the plant requirement for wheat or maize or other crops, basically. And you see the transpiration requirement there of about 400 millimeters. Uh, the real excess water use in rice is actually in maintaining this flooded soil condition that we have in rice paddies, uh, and that leads to a, a little bit more cost in, of water use in land preparation, in evaporate, evaporative losses from the surface of the paddy, uh, but particularly, potentially large losses of water by percolation through the soil profile. And you see that 
this is a highly variable amount depending on the soil texture. If you have a, a heavy clay, maybe a millimeter a day, but if you have a sandy soil, you can be use, losing many centimeters per day. So it varies a lot. Probably on average, uh, rice uses two to three times as much water uh, than other, other crops. Um, in, this is a pro projection of water scarcity uh, in 2025 by the International Water Management Institute in Sri Lanka. And the, the orange colored areas are those where you will have physical water scarcity. And this is measured really in availability of surface water and not groundwater. So this is actually a deficiency of this study. Uh, but you can see that uh, many of these places where we've talked about uh, there being a lot of irrigation, uh, also being a lot of water scarcity. The purple color is where you will have economic scarcity of water. And these authors define that mostly in terms of lack of infrastructure to use the water that is available. And this is even true then of, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, economic scarcity to us doesn't mean lack of availability or infrastructure. It means the actual cost to the farmer of pumping. Although it is true that in parts of the country, shallow tube wells are going dry in the dry winter season as the rivers uh, drop, as Holly mentioned. In Bangladesh, the use of groundwater to produce rice is very important. There are roughly a million shallow tube wells across the country accessing, in some cases, high arsenic water to irrigate rice. And you can see here the growth of this winter or boro season rice over time. And it now is uh, actually slightly more important in terms of overall rice production in the country than the main monsoon rice season is. And Bangladesh went from being almost the worst uh, case in terms of food insecurity to now being self-sufficient pretty much in rice. So this has made a big impact on food security in the country. Uh, this is another version of that uh, groundwater arsenic map. And you can see that um, a lot of the country is uh, at levels that we would not like to certainly drink. Um, we prepared also a map of a soil arsenic on a very uh, coarse scale, only about 400 data points here. But what you can clearly see in, in the, the, the darker gray, the higher the values, and going to values that are more than 20 parts per million in the soil, Whereas the, the global sort of national, or the global soil uh, uncontaminated background level would be around five parts per million. So these values are getting up pretty high. You can see that the, surf the soil, which is really the surface sediment material, is elevated in arsenic in the Ganges floodplain and, and not in the other parts of the country so much. So uh, this is then of particular interest. So we have both water contamination with arsenic and uh, parts of the country where we have uh, soil contamination with arsenic too. And this soil contamination is partly geological, I'm sure, high background levels, and partly is exacerbated by the use of high arsenic irrigation water. So this has two uh, complications for rice production. One is arsenic is toxic to plants, including rice. Uh, and the high uh, bioavailability of arsenic in this flooded soil environment leads to high uptake by rice, meaning that the, the grain quality is poor and potentially also contributes to adverse human health effects. So we actually looked at uh, potential uh, solutions to that. Hmm. Well, okay, sorry, I got, my, got ahead of myself here. What I want to show you first then that is rice, uh, arsenic is toxic to rice. And we did this study in a particular tube well command area in Faridpur district where 
there was an arsenic gradient created across this command area by the use of irrigation water that had about 100 parts per billion arsenic in it over a 20 year time period. And you can see this gradient goes from less than 15 to actually about 60 parts per million in the soil. So we grew uh, the main winter season rice variety, Beridon 29, across this soil arsenic gradient in two successive years, and this is what happened to yield. So a lot of arsenic toxicity, this variety um, is relatively vulnerable to arsenic toxicity and a pretty linear decrease over that range in soil arsenic concentration. So what can we do about this? Uh, is there something way, some way that we can manage this through water management or reduce the toxicity? And yes, there is. The idea here would be to grow rice under a less reduced condition with less water use. Uh, and this would make the arsenic less soluble in the soil solution. And then hopefully we would reduce the toxicity issue. So we chose to do this through a particular system. There's different ways of doing this. We used a raised bed and furrow irrigation system. We want, specifically wanted to get away from the flood irrigation of a flat field, which has all sorts of other negative effects that I don't have time to go into. This bed can be made by locally produced machinery uh, behind a a two-wheel Chinese tractor that is basically starts out as a big rototiller, but you can put various other kinds of attachments on it. In the right panel there, you can see very healthy-looking rice growing on a, on a raised bed with some water in the furrows. In our experiment then, this was fairly early in the growth. On the right-hand side, you can see the conventional flooded paddy and the raised beds on the left. You notice wide spacing between rows and actually uh, quite a, uh, a reduction in the plant population there compared to the conventional paddy on the right. Early on, uh, earlier than this photograph, the rice on the beds looked worse than the conventional. Here it looks pretty similar. A bit later on you can see that the, the rice on the raised bed is looking much healthier than that on the right. And at harvest, again, you can see the on the right, the, the, the crop is more mature. Uh, it's not got as many panicles and as much rice as the uh, beds on the left there. And this was the impact on the crop productivity. So using this raised bed with less water, uh, 30 to 40% less irrigation water was used. Uh, you can see that we minimize, we don't entirely eliminate the toxicity to rice, but we reduce it so if you've got soil arsenic roughly less than 40 parts per million, uh, you would be okay. We've looked at different rice, how different rice varieties respond to arsenic toxicity. This is just a slide showing results from a few varieties. You can see that uh, different varieties behave differently in the conventional paddy that uh, BR20 BR45 in this uh, one is the one that is most vulnerable and BR47 in those great blue triangles is the most tolerant across that whole range of soil arsenic concentration. And then BR36 is not affected until about 40 microgram or 40 parts per million and then the, it, it plummets as you go to about 60. Uh, on the right hand side, those uh, two graphs just show the performance of rice on the raised bed compared to the conventional system. And you can see that in these cases it, it performed uh, quite well. The other issue is the, the, the arsenic content in the rice itself, both the straw and the grain, because the straw is used for animal feed, and of course the grain is used for human food. Uh, so basically here on the left you can see that arsenic in the straw was reduced a lot by um, the raised bed compared to the conventional rice paddy. Uh, on the right hand side you can see that the arsenic in the rice grain was also reduced 
uh, in those first, uh, those first two arsenic levels, but not at the higher two arsenic levels. So at this level, probably there's some in physiological interference in terms of transport, translocation within the plant. Uh, we have grown rice with much less water, and this is a, a complicated set of experiments, but so I don't really want to explain them, but basically the, the numbers in parentheses represent the number of days that the rice is grown without flooded, without the, the, this was a greenhouse experiment, but without the container being flooded. And then the bottom two are a saturated condition and a moist condition where the water table is maintained at a depth of 10 centimeters with the saturated condition and 20 centimeters with the moist condition. I just want to point out the result with the moist condition. And you can see that, um, at that in that case, the uh, straw arsenic concentration was 0.06 parts per million versus about seven or so with the conventional system and the grain arsenic was 0 0.012. So if you grow rice really in an environment with much less water, you can almost eliminate arsenic from the plant. Not, it, so it becomes like wheat or maize. However, the problem with this is that the yield of rice is, dra is dramatically reduced by this treatment, as you can see uh, in those far, uh, those two bars on the far right. So basically, if we're going to adopt this strategy, we need to have rice varieties that are more tolerant of aerobic conditions. Um, although these aerobic conditions I'm talking about are still pretty wet, having a water table at 20 centimeters is still pretty wet for growing crops in general. But this is an avenue that I think we, we probably can succeed with. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> My background is mechanical engineering, so I'm not a water person. So I want to somehow try to convert this into an energy talk. <laughs> okay, so you, you, you know, and hopefully I can make a connection and, uh, you know, so. Uh, working, um, Closely with uh, the Water Center, with Professor Lal, uh, Kapil Narula, who's based in India, Ram Fishman, who was a graduate student here, uh, now a uh, fellow, postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, and many others in the field team. And the, you know, I wanted to discuss a little bit of the India water situation, its connection to energy and the political economy of how the groundwater situation in India came about to be um, what it is today. And since electricity had a lot to do with it, I'm trying to see if electricity can get us out of it as well. Okay. Now, I think uh, the speakers earlier have already pointed out how Groundwater plays a pretty important role, an increasingly important role in irrigation compared to surface water. And the same is true of India, perhaps more so than any other place. And today, maybe about a few years ago, five years ago, was a kind of important point where more irrigation in India occurred from groundwater than surface water. And of course, today it is even higher. So. So over the 50-year history of independent India, 60-year history, um, we have gone from a point where groundwater was maybe less than 5% to something like 55-60% today. Surface water irrigation, which was the dominant method, is now um, not the dominant method. In fact, it's less than 50%. So just a big picture of India, you know, in 50 years, food production went up by 4.2, you know, uh, times. So that's four, four-fold increase in food production. Population went up by about three. So clearly there was more food per capita. And this had a lot to do with the Green Revolution. Right? And rice 
went up four, wheat went up ten times. But very interesting to keep in mind that pulses, which were kind of a protein source, and coarse cereals, which are very adapted to rain-fed situations, such as millet, sorghum, actually went up less than two times. So the per person, that source, and this has its own consequences. You know, we have traded calories for protein. How does this project into the future? I don't know. Will it be a very starch plus some other protein source, the direction China is going or not? That, that has its own consequences. Okay, because pulses from a protein per water perspective are pretty good. Okay, but that just gives you a sense that we have to meet calorific needs, we have gone this direction. Okay, how was it achieved? You know, land area, uh, actually increasing amount of land was very little to play a role. Most of it was through increasing yields or production per unit land. Some of it was double cropping, but we'll see most of it was through irrigation. And of course, you know, the white, I, I, you know, we cannot, I'm not proposing that all that yield came from irrigation alone. It was a combination of fertilizer, seed and irrigation. Um, now, if you look at a big picture, this is from about six years ago, uh, but the picture hasn't changed that much. Total food production in India, 210 million tons. It's probably about 230, 240 now. Irrigated land produces 60% of the food from 40% of the land. Right? Rain-fed produces 40% um, of the food from 60% of the land. So the irrigated yields are about 2.25 times uh, rain-fed yields. Now, one could argue what's the additional food from irrigation is that that's about, you know, if, if you just compare the difference, it would be about 70 million tons. But if you say, oh, you know, you would never have had this irrigated uh, yields at all in the dry season without water, then you would say, and if all of it came from irrigation, you say, oh, that's about, so about 100 million tons is from irrigation, right? Now, I want to give a historical perspective. So this irrigation now is dominantly from groundwater. Now, I, I want to come to uh, this in a, in a second, but what I want to point out to it, point out is that the dominant form of groundwater irrigation today is through electric pumps. And the electricity is supplied by a government parastatal or a utility. There is significant amount of diesel pumps as well, but the dominant contribution to this food production comes from electricity pumps. So want to give you a little bit of a history of this um, because I think it is important. Uh, Post-independence, India got independence in 1947, in 50s, early 60s actually electricity coverage was not that high but where the electricity coverage was there, there was meters people would pay for electricity, but the meter collectors were by and large, sorry, the meter readers were by and large subcontracted staff. Now in one state in Uttar Pradesh, the meters readers wanted to become part of the utility to get benefits, the same, you know, health and whatever vacation benefits as, you know, because they were just subcontracted out, so they went on a strike. They went on a, such a long strike that, you know, no meters were read for a very long time. Finally, the state caved in and made them part of the regular staff. At which point they stopped reading meters altogether. <laughs> so, so, th so then, you know, the state said, wait a minute, you know, we are in this weird situation. How can we collect tariff? So they said, okay, we won't read meters because that's, you know, uh, we don't have staff anymore that is willing to do that. Can we just look at the horsepower of the pump and charge you by the horsepower of the pump? So that was the beginning of flat tariff. Okay, so that you don't want to meet, read meters every month. But then, you know, this became, you know, okay, so now that was the first entry point for farmers. Okay, we can use more, but we wanted to pay for more as long as our pump horsepower is the same. 
So this was the beginning of the flat tariff regime, which is I just pay a fixed price, I can use as much as I want, and maybe I can buy a 5 horsepower motor, but it really is 7 horsepower, but the nameplate is 5 and those kind of games started. Gradually, this became so organized that the farmers actually became a lobby and convinced the government to not charge for electricity at all. So then once it happened in one state, this started to spread. The other states also the farmers organized and said, you know. Now, at the t you know, farmers are large in number, they are very strong politically. Yeah. In India, of course, they are very large number compared to here, but in other countries also, small number of farmers carry a lot of clouds. So I am not, you know, saying good or bad about this, but this is the history of it, okay. Now, so that led to the utility actually was in this situation where the government asked the utility to supply power, but cannot collect revenue. So gradually, the, the utility started to ignore agriculture customers, it would not replace a transformer that would get burnt out, it would not, you know, it would uh, uh, not give new connections. Gradually, it started to stop supplying 24 hours at all. They would say, look, we only have so much electricity and we can't supply 24. So in order to reduce or match demand to supply, since there was no metering or no billing, they started to reduce the number of hours of supply. So the number of hours of supply gradually became 8 to 10. But even though the 8 to 10 hours of supply per day became of erratic voltage, it would not be, you know, the full voltage, uh, it would not be three phase. So then farmers started to invest in capacitor banks so that they can use single phase to run a three phase motor. So there's a whole industry of electrical engineering and all this started in the rural sector. You know, this is kind of chicken, you know, mouse and cat game of the girls. So, Anyway, but this really contributed to increase in food production, okay, in spite of all these headaches, I don't want to, you know, uh, eventually 2001, there are 10 million electric pumps, okay, today could be 15 million, then one government, and which is actually the place where we are working, uh, was tried what was considered a very progressive experiment, and here's the experiment that they did. Okay, so, so where is Gujarat first of all, I, that's why I was looking for a map to stick it in there. Okay, so this Gujarat is, uh, let me see if I can use uh, this, yeah, so Gujarat, this is the state of Gujarat right here, okay. Now this is an antiquated depth map of Gujarat, you know, this is, you know, of course a data challenge in India, even though we measure depths every five years, we have a whole census, we have very poor actually transparency and mapping of the data. It shows here, you know, in this map, we are sort of right here, it shows maybe 10 meters. You know, we are working with 200 meter depth water there, okay, in, in the actual monitoring wells. Okay, so, uh, that, that's where we are. But this state tried a very, and that, that's, that's the where the state is, uh, right here, and this is where we are working in this area, North Gujarat. They tried a very, um, uh, what was considered a progressive experiment, they said, look, we have com committed to the farmers to give free electricity. We are having to provide shoddy electricity as a result of the fact that it is free. But since infrastructure is common, all the other part of the rural economy, such as agro-processing, you know, there is education, there is health, there is household, they are also getting shoddy electricity. So what do we do? So they said, we will take every substation and run two wires from the substation. So this is how it looks. I'm going to skip this. So we're going to, instead of wires running to each village, right, and you know, this is a conventional architecture. You have the same infrastructure that supplies an agriculture customer or a domestic customer or a commercial customer because it's expensive to deploy infrastructure. They said we'll run now a parallel infrastructure to each village. One wire will provide electricity for farmers which will come on only eight hours a day and there'll be another parallel wire 
which will be a 24 hour wire, which will be paid wire. See, because if you mix the paid and free wire, then you don't know how much went in. So, imagine an entirely parallel infrastructure was created. Now, the shock is that this heavy investment, which cost about $500 per pump, was recovered within two years because of the net extra revenue that it generated because now all these people could pay and use the electricity. Okay. But it was still a massive investment. Okay. Now, I'll come to this later, but this model has been now considered very successful even though it seems absurd that one would do this if India had to do this with you know 10 million pumps, $500 per pump, you know you are talking about 5 billion dollars just to run this parallel wire all because you want to provide free electricity to this wire. Now, a simple device such as an electricity meter could actually meet that demand by on a common wire. So you could have a common wire and a electricity meters on all of this and convince the agriculture customer that certain amount of electricity that is metered is essentially free. Some biophysical amount or something. Or you could come up with some other scheme. My point is that years of lack of trust between government and the farmers created a situation where any attempt at metering that power was fraught with suspicion. And that led to free electricity which meant that the marginal cost of water was zero which meant I don't even have to put a valve on my tap or the pipe. Millions of these pumps don't even have a shut off valve. When the electricity comes on, the water comes out whether the plant needs it or not or whether there is even plant on the field or not. Okay. So, so big picture of this is 100 billion kilogram of food through irrigation. About my estimate is that 50 percent is from electric because about 70 percent, 60, 70 percent is from groundwater and dominant of that is electric as opposed to diesel. And if you look at what is the reported amount of electricity going to agriculture, that is 2 kilowatt hour per kilogram of food today. Okay. It varies from 1 to 3 from parts of India to other parts of India. In North Gujarat where the groundwater table is deeper is 3, could be 3.5 but that gives you a sense of just for irrigation pumping how much energy is going. Okay. Sorry for the numbers being in rupees but let me just put very simply um, that this three units of electricity in the US, you know, would cost 45, 50 cents. In the India, it's 30 cents. And the cost of one or the price of one kilogram of wheat, if I looked it up today, $280 a ton, 30 cents. In other words, if you actually had to, you know, this is a complex economic situation, if you actually had to charge for this, the food price would have to double or the farmer. Or if or the alternative would be, you tell the farmer, look, you have to pay for it, they might stop farming, reality might be somewhere in between, but just so that you get a sense today, the rough price of food that it fetched is the same as the amount that the government gave to the farmer in free electricity. One could imagine if you gave that, you know, as an amount to the farmer that, look, why don't you just have the money and not the electricity? What the farmer would do is a good question, right? So, okay. So uh, that that's that's the same thing I wanted to point out. So that's the problem part of it. And you know, I I'm not going to go. We have experts here on this issue in this part of Gujarat. Over the years and years, people have punched through, you know, clay sort of layers to get to deeper and deeper water tables. This is where we are working and uh, you know in uh, so so what are we trying as a potential way out of this right. So the question is if farmers are provided an entitlement right, metered entitlement this is what you were getting every year for the last few years but 
If you consume less than that entitlement, we will provide you an incentive or a compensation. That would be one way, because that way the political economy aspects are preserved, the farmers, you know, otherwise if the moment we talk about pricing or metering, anybody in the government will say, are you crazy? Get out of here. This will never work because we will be thrown out of election. In the next election, we will be out of power. So you have to, you know, so the question is just like the early stages kind of snowballed into something. Can we now create a new example, a new paradigm? And maybe that can snowball to change this situation. That's, that's the question. So, so the question is if we tell the farmer that you will have this entitlement, but if you use less than that entitlement, then the thing is that electricity is worth so much that the utility can turn around and sell that electricity to other customers. And so the, for the utility, it's a win-win situation. For the farmer, they still have the entitlement that they had. So now, but of course, this raises questions of how do you distribute, define this entitlement? Will farmers agree to be metered? Will the utility be able to administer? So, I want to say that first of all, this first one is the thorny question that we are trying to address. I can tell you that this is something we have now been convinced that the farmers have, a, you know, when properly explained the scheme, totally willing to meter. So this kind of paranoia that the farmer will not allow metering, which is what we constantly faced. At least I can say that what we have learned in the last few months, we have managed to convince the utility to actually offer this scheme at their own expense. Uh, they have a little bit watered down and I'll show you how they watered it down, but just to give you a sense of the political realities, right? So here's how they watered it down. You know, we recommended that, look, why don't you compensate at the same price as you would sell that electricity to somebody else? But they made it half of that. So that now if the farmer saves, they get to keep half, etc. Right? So, you know, they, whereas they could have made it a strong lever, right? We said, what if a farmer can save 30%, 40%, maybe, you know, uses some fancy technique to reduce water dramatically. But they were worried about giving too much compensation. So they capped it at 15%. I feel like everything we asked, they made it half. So we should have made it, maybe ask for double first or something, you know. We said, you know, can we do this for five years? Can you guarantee for five years so that the farmer can make capital improvements? If you just do one year, they, were, they made it three years. So anyway, you know, uh, I'm also learning about the Indian government, even though I'm from India. So, uh, so I think that, you know, but, but the spirit of it is there, uh, you know. Uh, so, uh, and, and, uh, you know, so, so there are now some sort of thorny, what I call smaller byproduct issues also arising. So here's a byproduct issue. Okay, if the marginal cost of water is zero, and you have created a big pump, uh, tell me by the way how I'm on time. Um, I'm done. Okay, so 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 the marginal cost of water is zero. Right now, therefore. If I have excess capacity, I'm willing to sell that water to my neighbor who might be quite poor, who might actually be a distant relative, and I'm willing to supply that water at very low price to somebody who could not afford to drill a deep well. So here's something interesting, right? It, it was fundamentally a bad idea, but now it has some good consequence. And the good consequence is that you can use that extra capacity to sell this water to, at a cheap price to a water buyer. Now if we try to put a marginal price on water, I might forget about that relative. Right? What happens to that? So, so, you know, sometimes an entrenched system creates this. So, it is by the way turning out that, you know, at least in the area we are working, the long historical relationship the farmers have with each other in the community, they are not willing to turn off that power that supply of water even after marginal pricing. So that's, uh, you know, uh, so there's some sociological maybe lessons here as well. Uh, now, 
and you know different time of the year the consumption is different so here's how we proposed how do you create this entitlement okay we had long internal debates and working with the government either you can create an entitlement based on land owned but not everybody might be irrigating the same amount of land so how do you create that you can create an entitlement based on you know depth of water in the area what crop you grow it can get very complicated but the government advised us that the entitlement that is likely to work is something that preserves the status quo in other words those who have a certain degree of pump don't take away anything from them otherwise they'll right so so it's interesting political economy that the entitlement is therefore based on the past 3 years of use in the area and based on your pump size so if on average each pump was run for 2000 hours in that very specific location then the entitlement is in the form of that many hours of use for that pump and its horsepower now if you then and then so we had to go measure those horsepower carefully again the issues with that then you you know if you change that horsepower that is its own issues so this is not simple but it does allow a potential way out now what is very interesting is and i'm going to skip this i'm going to skip this i want to just go to where the debate is today so what is very interesting is in this last year or two when we started this project suddenly this issue has gained a lot of momentum okay people are by the way trying to reform energy subs everything people have been trying to do in india for 20 years right anything they have been trying to reform this stuff for a long time suddenly this thing has picked up a lot of momentum so now everybody is looking at the gujarat idea of should we separate these feeders first and you know this is you know billions of dollars of investment so they are looking at that and our debate and question is that from what we have learned so far and we have been really actually doing this experiment only for a few months it took us 3 years to convince the government i won't go there but that you know question is from what little have we learned and the government's excitement to do something about this at this particular point in time how can we shape the policy for the rest of india based on what we have learned otherwise we may go down a path based on something that we knew 5 years ago and scale it up so i will just leave it at that and maybe come in questions so that's that is, and that's my talk here. okay so i feel like i'm being overexposed here relative to the audience uh come back again so this this talk was designed to actually follow vijay closely um and the question vijay raised is okay so these people are using a certain amount of energy and water suppose we give them a way by which there is some incentive for them to use less how do they get there you know do they grow less if you do that then you're back to the conundrum that vijay raised if you give them a way to do on farm efficiency then maybe you can get there but the question is that there are many ways to get to that why is it that these people are not using them and you know is, is there some way we can get there so what i'm going to do is basically cover three things a quick background on punjab which is another state in india that um, grows most of the food for the country basically in terms of what the what the government procures uh, i'll talk a little bit about some insights we got from our field experiment and then finally i'll point to the direction that vijay and i think we are going with this so starting out with punjab it this is a state which has about 1.5% of the total land area of the country and contributes 57% of the total grain that is produced okay so that's remarkable the question is how do you do that and you do that with a cropping intensity which is about 189% uh you irrigate your entire area and uh it started out as a surface water irrigation scheme and now it's pri primarily groundwater one interesting thing i've learned there which is just a quick anecdote to throw out fitting with the things which i've been talking about is that there is a major dam there that was built to provide surface irrigation and electricity it 
uh, when it was built, it contributed about a third of the electricity in North India, you know, all of North India. Today, I learned that 91% of the water diverted from the canals never reaches the intended users. So it's very hard to talk about water scarcity when you, know, you have that sort of a situation. So if the people don't get it, they use groundwater. So that's the story. And uh, most of this area now grows rice and wheat. Traditionally, it grew pulses, which is what our optimization model also says it should do. Um, but the productivity totally is the highest in India. So it's nine and a half tons of rice and wheat put together over the, the cycle that they go through. And then they have an intermediate crop of pulses. Uh, this is basically what has happened with the overall production in Punjab in terms of crop choice. And starting in the 70s when the government started procuring rice from there, they have basically become a rice state. Prior to that, this was not a story at all. Turns out, as both two speakers pointed out earlier, rice is the major water consumer out of this. In addition to being a major water consumer, if you overwater it, you have a serious problem. Okay, so that's essentially the background story. Um, here, basically, it's showing the groundwater drop, which is continuing at a rate of about a meter per year. Uh, from the map that Vijay was showing of depth to groundwater, that was 10 to 20 meters. Today, you're looking at 30 to 60 meters below surface. So that's that story. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this and move to this part. So this is the productivity increases in rice and wheat. So with irrigation and fertilizers and better seeds, they've gone from two and a half tons to about four and a half tons in both. And that comes with a quadrupling of a five times increase in the electricity that's being used. Okay? So that's the part that Vijay was basically emphasizing as well. So and, and doubling of fertilizer. Skip that along. So our diagnosis of the problem in this particular state with regard to why the water situation is going to get bleaker and bleaker, and if this state contributes 57% of the total food of the country, the cost of producing that food is going to go up dramatically, or they're not going to produce it. So that's the bottom line story. So why does this come? It comes because the government chooses to produce, procure rice and wheat from a place which should not be growing rice. And it comes because they give free electricity, the part that Vijay talked about. So the water use turns out to be 150% of the total rainfall in the place, which is you know, pretty remarkable to achieve. And much of the total energy used in the state goes not for industry, commerce, health, etc., but for pumping groundwater. Okay? Uh, in Gujarat, Vijay didn't point it out. It's a similar number or larger in that area. So that's... The outcomes from this are that the energy subsidy, the money that the government is spending on energy, exceeds the education budget or the health budget. And you, you have taken a situation which was highly in industrializing in the past, and the industry is gone. Uh, the, OK, so for the farmers, it's interesting. The paradigm that most people told us was similar to what Vijay described, that the farmers will never be willing to be metered. It turns out farmers in our surveys indicate a willingness to be metered. So you ask the question, why? And the answer to that is that they experience regular costs of deepening wells uh, and higher horsepower motors. So their reaction is, this is not sustainable, and we actually do want to pay, but we want reliable electricity. To deliver reliable electricity, the state wants to do the feeder separation that we really talked about. So, so that's regurgitating some of that. Uh, also, what has started happening here is that because of high use of nitrogen, uh, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizers, and pesticides, and high rate of groundwater application, the shallow groundwater is now highly polluted. So you have maternal mortality rates, uh, maternal cancer rates, infant mortality rates, which are three times the national average in a state which has the highest per capita income or the second highest per capita income in the country. So not a good story. So what we tried to do was we tried a three-part strategy here. The uh, first is the story that Vijay talked about, except in the state of Punjab, the politicians weren't willing to go at all. So we gave up on that. The second is a strategy similar to what John talked about, which is do aerobic rice, which was being pro pro promised by people as a strategy which would be useful. And the last is we tried to see if we could actually train these people to use a device which measures 
the soil moisture stress and then apply water correspondingly instead of just willy nilly watering. So the goal from all this was to see if we could reduce the water application which goes one to one on energy reduction and then see what the benefits are out of that. So that's basically the idea here. So uh, I'll skip some of these things and focus on the red one and basically the question that is asked is ways of measuring soil moisture or ways of reducing water usage in rice are manifold, they exist. Uh, the best state university extension program in India is in this state. So why is it that this is not going through? And the question that then maps into, can you come up with an experiment where you allow these people to do various things, see which one they really like, and then see if you can scale that up. That up. Okay, so that's the way we approach this. So uh, that's basically that story. So the device that I, I'm talking about is called a tensiometer. In the US it's sold for between 60 to $250. So if you are a farmer making a certain amount of money in India, Punjab is high, but we could look at other places too. This is not something that you're willing to use, okay? The device on the left is the so-called high-end device. Actually, there are much higher-end devices with electronics in them, but that's the one that's going for a fair amount of money in India. What the people at the Punjab Agricultural University did is remove the pressure gauge on this device and just put colored paper, which is red, yellow, green, tuned for rice. So if it goes to yellow, you need to water. If it goes to red, you've waited too long. And the way this device works is that basically it's got a plaster cast at the bottom, which is porous and allows water to come in. So it sits in the soil. If that water, sorry, it's the, so it sits in the soil and what you do is you fill the tube with water and then you seal it at the top. So then as the, so, as the soil depletes in water, the water from the tube starts going out and when it gets to a certain suction pressure, you have that and you water. That's it, okay? So very simple. This comes down to roughly uh, seven to eight dollars instead of sixty dollars from doing this. So we put this out and um, these are, there's a picture in the field, there's all these farmers so you can get a flavor of what these people look like. And the basic results that we got out of this was in the first year we had 525 farmers who tried this, who tried the direct seeding of rice, and we had people who had done laser leveling of their fields and some people who had not. So we inherited that as a mix in the overall experiment. So the bottom line turned out to be the following. It took us six weeks through the Punjab Agricultural University to recruit these 500 farmers. They were pretty skeptical about the whole experiment. They had to be cajoled. There were women, students, and faculty who were involved. They, they tell me that they cried to get these people to do what was required, and they then did it. So that's you know useful, I guess, to remember <laughs> as a strategy. So anyway, what turned out was that these farmers did a pair test. So they have an acre under tensiometer or laser leveling or direct seeding of rice, and then they have the rest of their land. They do whatever they want there. Uh, the farmers who, there were 85% of the farmers stuck with it, saved about 30% water in the process and were very enthused about being salespeople for this idea. The other 15% had a variety of reasons why they didn't follow it so they didn't save anything. But if you average all those across, it turns out that you save about 22% of water. If you were in a research setting rather than random farmers doing whatever they want with no controls and no in inducements to actually follow the program, you would probably save 35-40% water in the process. Okay? But this is essentially a field test with human behavior thrown in. So that was kind of interesting. And we started thinking about, okay, this translates into a very quick payoff. This looks good. Farmers want to do it. How do you scale it up? So that's the experiment going on this year. And the, Big insight we had was, okay, maybe we can go to farmer cooperatives. These cooperatives exist to buy fertilizer in bulk and then divide it up and go to them and see if they are willing to take this on. So we took the, some of the farmers who had used it the previous year, they went to them, and in 10 days we had 5,500 farmers recruited. So that's pretty interesting in terms of the dynamic for how this works. So what happens this year? We have a disaster. Uh, the disaster is the following. That device was made by this person who's a professor at the university with some people working with him and he's sitting there gluing things together to make this device. Uh, to make 5,500 of them was a challenge for him. So he delivered 3,800 when the season started. 
and he was that was under quite a bit of abuse from the rest of us. Uh, Two thousand of those things failed right away. They leaked, or other disasters happened. So, we have been now trying to think about okay, what is a robust way of coming up with a device that could actually do this and more? Okay, so we scoured the marketplace and started looking at what are the technology choices. And some of the issues that come up are we want something that does not require training to use. Okay, we want it to be low cost, under ten bucks. We want to know what density it should be installed at. We want to know that it's robust enough not to have issues with leakage and so on. And more of what, what these people were doing with it was they were deciding when to irrigate. Okay, if the thing went down, we want to also stop irrigation. And the logic for that is that if you're applying fertilizer, it leaches through with overwatering. So when you have applied enough, you want to stop. So you want stop, start, start. And to be more precise about it, we also want to monitor the nitrogen in the soil continuously. So we want all this and we want it for under 10 bucks. Can it be done? Okay, so that's sort of the goal. So this is some attributes of soil and you can do gravimetric, volumetric or suction pressure measurements of what's going on. And field capacity is the number that you want to target for most crops. So that basically says that there is enough water in there that the soil, that the plant can suck it without really much effort. And um, that's basically the idea. If it goes to wilting point, that's bad. So if you look at suction, 10 to 33 is the number that you're shooting for in kilopascals. Here's a variety of devices that are out there in the market. And you can see that the tensiometer thing that we used basically works well through about 80 kilopascals. But you need to be around 30, 15 to 35, it turns out. So that's not bad. The things that are, that, are, that, are, that are at the top do very well across a very broad spectrum of range. Now what happens is that these things cost between $20 to $30,000. Okay? So that's not so good and we still don't have any sense of how we would come up with a way to stop watering or nitrogen on it. So we fooled around and uh, we also looked at the spatial attributes. These are sensors at three different depths, at three locations, and what you see is that their behavior is quite different. And these are located quite close to each other. So the spatial variability is important and you have to pay attention to it. So even if you're in the US and you want to buy a $30,000 sensor, you may want to think about what to do because each of these sensors only measures soil moisture in two to 10 centimeters of soil around it. So that's not so hot. So we've looked at a whole bunch of these things and uh, we are headed towards something like this, which is made in China, uh, and in many people's view it is junk, because it's made in China by definition, it must not be very good, but this is an electrical resistivity device. There are also similar capacitance-based devices. This particular device came from China, shipped for six dollars, okay? It measures pH, it measures soil moisture, and it measures light. Okay, so it's not quite the right combination of things we were looking for, but close enough, right? So, and, it, and if you buy 10,000 of them, it's $3. Now, Vijay, being a sensors expert, is looking at airbags, capacitance sensors on airbag, and those apparently cost two bucks. So we are thinking we can get there. And the general idea is that if you do an integration across some of these, maybe you can just spray them all over the landscape, and you can get a very precise measurement of what you're trying to do. And uh, the kind of things that we would like to be able to achieve are done, once I started blanketing, everybody I know who does soil moisture sensors will request, saying this is our specs. Can you do it and we sell a million of them for you per year? Uh, what I learned was that most of these people sell five to 10,000 soil moisture sensors a year, largely to research clients, and they charge the large amounts of money for them, and they are not interested. They actually do not have any business sense. The guy from Decagon, the guy from Campbell Scientific, which are the major purveyors in the US, I said, you know, suppose you made a dollar per sensor and sold it, sold a million of them per year just in parts of India, or if you could get to five million a year, would you be interested? And he said, no, we don't have the capacity to do that. We would rather sell 10,000 and make $100 on each of them. So that's sort of the world we are dealing with, but I finally landed on somebody in Australia who said that he started fooling around with this with uh, his kid. So he made a device, the picture of the device is on the top left, it's called Full Stop, and it's a very ingenious device. He just takes a regular funnel, he sticks a tube in there, and the outer tube is just for protection, so the inner tube is in there, 
and basically what he has is a rod that goes through there which can flow. So he puts this in the soil, once the soil is wet, as the water is coming down and the wetting front comes through here, this water comes in here, it goes into the bottom of this thing, it makes the little rod float up and when it pops up, the farmer knows to stop watering. To add to it, he adds a little tube here to extract soil samples, water samples so that we can measure nitrogen. He says it costs him five bucks to make this, but he won't sell it for less than 20 bucks. Okay. So this is what you deal with when you deal with such people. They don't get what needs to be done, but he's done a full set of experiments here, very much in line with what we are interested in. And what he shows is that you get a reduction of about 30% in fertilizer application. You get a reduction of about 30% in water application. And all that is done with basically one such device out there. Okay? So the thing that I wanted to convey with this was that farmers want something that is consistent with their business model. It's red, yellow, green. Okay? Uh, the direction that the industry is going in is to add a whole bunch of electronics, have them transmit to a variety of people who will then sit there, look at also at remote sensing images from NASA satellites, and tell individual farmers what to do. Millions and millions of farmers will receive this information by cell phones and then they will act on it. Uh, it's a new version of command and control for nerdy engineers, and I'm not sure if that's going to happen. But maybe the engineers like Vijay, who are actually interested in practical solutions, will help us get to this particular point. Thank you very much, all, all uh, speakers. I'd like to invite you to uh, sit behind the table, and we have time for some questions. I realize that altogether this is quite a bit of listening. On the other hand, we have alternation between speakers, and I think that helps sustain the, the attention. Um, so the floor is open. Questions to any of our speakers? of the plant, he has a pretty good correlation in his mind as to what he's doing. If you're doing it through satellite, it's kind of interesting because you're looking at farmers who are farming an acre or two acres. The footprint of anything you're estimating from the satellite is quite different. Uh, you actually, if you're going to go looking at the plant, I would say if you can get some measure of whether or not the plant is starting to wilt or what the moisture deficit in the plant is, that may be more useful than measuring EP. Uh, ET is simply a proxy for the functioning of the plant, right? So th that, that would be my concern. And, and also, the relationship between the dry out, you know, the soil dry out, and the water that is not going to cause problems with salt? So, in all schemes that try to save water, in terms of irrigation application, you face this. If you do drip, you eventually have to do a soil flushing application also. Here, what we are thinking is that, for example, with rice, uh, just like John was saying, you are ending up keeping the soil more or less saturated. So the kilo, the it's a 15 kilopascal trigger is what the Punjab Agricultural University soil scientist has worked with us. For wheat or cotton, it's 35. So you can actually cycle things a bit more. My anticipation is by using the start-stop mechanism, you'll be watering much more often, but uh, much less. Okay. If you only have the start application, you'll be watering much more, but less frequently, compared to the current situation. Uh, 
We haven't dealt with that ourselves, but uh, the main experience with that is with GM Cotton in the places in India we are working with. They are getting an interesting bifurcation in the sense that they have lower pesticide application, uh, they have lower water use in the field of the farmer who's using it for cotton. Yeah, there is no experience with those. Cotton is the main one. Vijay, do you know? I am only cotton. Yeah. And because of Gujarat, that's... Yeah. The other thing I was going to add was, but the farmers who have fields adjoining the GM cotton field, they are complaining loudly because their uh, pests are basically attacking their crops. I was doing things we've always had problems with those right. that they, they have to be clean they're never accurate right. and they just never gave the right information right yeah no this is basically why we want to go to an electrically based device wait for the microphone Hello, hi. Um, I have a question regarding the, the use of tensiometers and maybe some other mechanical uses or, or other mechanical um, mechanisms to measure the, the, the water content in the soil. Um, I know that in rice may, it may be a bit difficult um, regarding the, the saturation of water in the soil, uh, in the soil. but I don't know, maybe use some um, drills or um, soil pits and teach the agriculturists to do that. I, I know that that is used in other type of of uh, crops, but I don't know if that can be applicable to what you were talking about. And maybe, I don't know, um, reduce the cost in the tensiometers. One of the, the, one of the techniques that the International Rice Research Institute is using to reduce water use is called alternative wetting and drying. So what they basically do is place in the soil a plastic tube, it's about four inches diameter, the lower part of that is perforated so water can enter into the tube. And basically they flood the field, then they let it drain until the water table is 15 centimeters below the soil surface. You can see that, see it then with this, where, where it is with this little tube device, and then you re-irrigate. So that's a simple way of sort of, of, of measuring, and, and they basically also will save 30, 40 percent in terms of water use. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask mine then while others come up with other questions. Um, the difference between Bangladesh and India, um, I, it's the first time, Vijay, that I heard why India had this heavy subsidy why do you think, does, does anyone have an idea why this didn't happen in Bangladesh? And maybe that may be a reason that you don't have uh, the same volume of pumping, groundwater pumping. So I can comment about, and I had actually a slide, I wish I had showed it, of a map of what parts of India have electricity pumps and what don't. What is very interesting is that the parts of India, which according to Manu's map showed are very suitable for rice, which are parts of Bihar, Orissa, West Bengal, and Assam, actually don't have elect that pervasive electricity infrastructure in the rural areas. So I don't know about Bangladesh as much, but the eastern part of India also is also the part where there was no electricity infrastructure, the, what little irrigation is through diesel pumps, but since the groundwater level is shallower, maybe the cost of irrigation wasn't that high. So that's, you know. Uh, I, I'll just add one comment which is speculative actually. I think the difference is democracy versus <laughs> lack of democracy. <laughs> Yeah, I could maybe add that in, in Bangladesh, most of the shallow tube wells are actually small diesel pumps. Uh, and there's, you know, it's pretty easy to install these wells, and, so, and farmers can move them around a lot if they need to. Uh, there is an issue with 
the government now promoting what they call deeper tube wells. They're not really deep. They're about 300, a little less than 300 feet, but they require a submersible pump with electricity, and they have problems with the electricity supply not being adequate um, for that. And, and Holly, what do you think about that plan to start pumping from 300 feet with electrical pumps? Yeah, uh, it would definitely affect the, the hydrology of the system. So, um, uh, yeah, in terms of arsenic, I, I don't think it would be, you know, there may not be arsenic at that depth. That's about 100 meters in some places, but it certainly would draw the arsenic down because it's it's fairly shallow, and that much pumping would mm -hmm. um, would change the flow path. So, 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 John, what is the motivation for the government to provide this? Well, initially, I, I think it was that um, you could have a larger command area, so you could you could serve more people, and I think they were concerned about the. Uh, parts of the country where in the dry season the shallow aquifer is actually the water table is dropping too low um, so that that's the one area that we actually work in with this raised beds is to try and work with these deep tube our command areas to be to use less water and then they could irrigate more of their command area questions uh, can I comment one thing, uh, Lex, on uh, your question? I mean, it is important to recognize that today the cost of the same unit of power from diesel is roughly three or four times that from grid electricity which is powered either by coal or hydro. So as groundwater tables get deeper, the, it would, for example, in the part of Gujarat I described, Agriculture would be impossible today with diesel. Because the pumps stay above well, the, the ground. ground yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zaya, question? Thank you. Um, my question is about the, the low water yields that you alluded to and um, how they had a, a lower yield overall, but they required less water. Is that uniform for, for other major crops like wheat and corn where there are um, sort of commercially viable options that use significantly less water? And did you have any estimates for sort of the trade-off between yield and water for these major crops? Oh, I th we were uh, talking specifically about rice. And obviously, um, if you grow wheat in Bangladesh in, the, in that same dry season, you will maybe, you'll irrigate it a maximum of three times, and in most cases, twice. So you, you're, you know, you're, you're not, um, having the soil nearly as, as moist. The problem with rice is, well, partly the physiology of the plant and the breeding that has gone towards uh, that type of physiology and the fact that the rooting system is pretty shallow in, in the soil, whereas with wheat and maize, the roots go deeper and they can access uh, water that is deeper in the soil. So, so rice is sort of unique as a crop plant. It's the only one that we grow in a flooded environment, basically. So there aren't really options to switch, to, to make that trade-off, yield for water? Well, um, I, from what we've learned, I think that, that, that trade-off is at a very abrupt point. You know, we're not quite exactly sure where that would be, but it would be, it's generally pretty difficult for farmers to manage uh, where, you, where you're close to a precipice, you know, you want, they, they want to be far away from it. So, but, but that's, you know, when you start talking about trade-offs between water and food, that, or that's a, at the national level, countries really want food security. And, the, and whatever it costs to get that, by and large, I think they're, they're sort of willing to invest in that. We have one more question in front, uh, Peter. Manu, you showed this graph of leveling off water use. And it, it was pretty much the way I could see it was a little bit uh, small labeling here the past 10 years or so. Yeah. So, but we are still drawing too much, right? Although it's leveling off. So what, how much would we have to decrease 
the youth, so you know, coming down from that plateau to lower levels to get into a quote-unquote uh, balance with uh, with nature, pretty much getting the, the water the water balance uh, in tune with what is provided. You mean in the Ogallala Aquifer is what you're asking? In, in the U.S. in general, but you could take well, the Ogallala the, the as, thing, as an example. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's a question of choices because, you know, which things do you want to cut? Because if you cut meats out, you know, basically beef, uh, then you see a very strong reduction overall very quickly. Uh, and the reality is that beef and pork have actually gone up in the last... 10 to 20 years rather than gone down. Uh, other than that, because the biggest user in that sense is alpha alpha. The other big thing that happened in the last decade, which was a counter directional move, was biofuels. But I think that story has died or is dying. So if you see, the reason it's hard to answer is what we would like to do is the same optimization in the US for what to grow where that we have done in India. Then I can answer your question more effectively because it could turn out that by displacing where things are grown. Uh, you know, what I did mention in the India example is we did not allow an increase in crop area or irrigated area, district by district. So it's a pretty hard constraint, especially distributed constraint. So if we did the same thing in the US, uh, and maybe you want to even say you have to reduce Colorado and Nebraska out, you know, because uh, the average amount of irrigated water application in those states is about four feet. Whereas if you get out to the southeast, uh, it's closer to about one to one and a half feet or so. And in the northeast, it's about 0.6 feet of irrigation application. So clearly there's room to grow stuff here. And you know you could increase irrigation here, and you could reduce it in the Midwest, and you'd be OK. Uh, the biggest lesson you get out of a country as geographically large as the United States is that scale really helps because you can average across these instances. So if you had a global free market on these things, then I think that would actually smooth out the water problem globally a fair amount. Uh, but as long as there are country issues involved, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think so. I think that uh, you know the scope is there for substantial reductions, sub substantial efficiency improvements, and substantial re reductions in use through optimizing on these things. Uh, so I think that's overblown. Uh, 10 years ago or five years ago, when we started looking at this stuff, I was not convinced of that. Today, I'm much more convinced. Okay, can I comment uh, on uh, Peter's question? In the Indian context, we are still so far from the yield potentials. Yeah. And the use of water is so inefficient that it is not inconceivable to get a factor four increase in food per unit water. So in interesting way, my feeling is that the, the Indian government's emphasis on what they call food security which is very important but the way it manifests itself is in this command and control approach of fixing prices not allowing farmers to sell land free electricity you can't do this you can't you know is actually preventing us potentially from getting to that point so i think that what i i think is a debate that needs to be had is whether the way food security is manifested in policies, are they actually preventing us to quickly reach to efficient points of high production, less water, high value, rather fast? It will, of course, involve fewer farmers probably and they're, and they're transitioning to something else. I think we are not looking at that picture as a whole. I guess I should add, I, I would say the bigger threat is mega droughts rather than running out because the, the things that Vijay is talking about, there's a time scale over which you can correct. You know, so the long term, I'm not worried. But on the current practices, if you get hit with mega droughts in a couple of places, you're simply not ready for it. We didn't do that. 
Okay, I think it's time to end this session. Uh, let's thank uh, our speakers again for uh, <laughs> telling us about both, uh, you know, laying out the problems, various problems, and proposing some solutions. The uh, next session in this uh, series, we haven't quite decided the theme yet, is uh, scheduled for January 26th. So hope to see you uh, in about. Uh,